This is Space Time, Series 22, Episode 29. Coming up on Space Time. The potentially deadly asteroid Bennu proves to be far more difficult to study than previously thought. The new study ruling out tiny black holes as a possible source of dark matter. And Israel's Genesis spacecraft achieves lunar orbit insertion. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. New close-up observations of the near-Earth asteroid Bennu show its surface to be far rockier and rougher than expected. The findings, reported in eight scientific papers in the journal Nature, show the 492-metre-wide space rock, which has a 1 in 2,700 chance of hitting the Earth, is a far more challenging target than what mission managers had originally designed for. The new data represents the first detailed close-up observations gathered by NASA's OSIRIS-REx spacecraft since arriving at Bennu in October last year. While it confirms many of the measurements obtained by ground-based observations, it shows a far more rugged, boulder-strewn surface than anyone had expected. Bennu is also far more varied in brightness than expected, prompting mission engineers and scientists to re-evaluate some of the approaches designed around the mission's primary goal, that of collecting samples of surface material or regolith and returning it back to Earth. OSIRIS-REx principal investigator Dante Loretta from the University of Arizona says Bennu is clearly one of the darkest objects in the solar system, with far rougher than expected terrain. Mission managers originally developed their sampling strategy around what was known about Bennu when the mission was designed. They expected at least some relatively smooth patches of surface, with gravel and small pebbles, covering open terrain stretching out over areas of at least 50 metres across. Plenty of room to land a spacecraft. Instead, they found only a really small number of open spaces devoid of large boulders. And these are tiny, just 5 to 20 metres wide, meaning they'll pose a real hazard to the spacecraft when it touches down for its sample collection. The high-resolution images reveal a surface packed with more than 200 boulders larger than 10 metres across, and many more over a metre wide. The largest boulder they've identified measured some 58 metres. The observations also confirm that Bennu is one of the darkest objects in the solar system, reflecting only 4% of all the sunlight that reaches it. And its surface features also vary greatly from one area to another with respect to brightness. This high variability in reflected light, known as albedo, represents a challenge for the laser on the spacecraft's LIDAR system designed to guide the sample acquisition approach. The observations also show the asteroid is shaped like a spinning top, It's estimated to be between 100 million and a billion years old. Overall, that means the asteroid surface is much older than expected, but there's also evidence of some more recent activity. There are high-standing ridges running from Bennu's north to south pole, and they appear to direct the flow of surface material. Features such as the infill of large craters, fractured boulders, and a deficiency in small impact craters all hint at a dynamic surface with ongoing changes. Bennu is what's considered to be an asteroid rubble pile with lots of void spaces inside, up to 60% total porosity. But its shape indicates it does have interior stiffness, with enough internal friction or cohesion to allow the surface to crack. The spectral data confirms Bennu's classification as a primitive carbonaceous chondrite. It also confirms the presence of lots of hydrated minerals ubiquitous across the surface of the asteroid. There's evidence for molecules that contain oxygen and hydrogen atoms bonded together, known as hydroxyls. These hydroxyl groups exist globally across the asteroid in water-bearing clay minerals, meaning that at some point this rocky material interacted with water. Now, while Bennu itself is too small to have ever hosted liquid water, the findings do suggest that liquid water was present at some time on Bennu's parent body, which would have been a much larger asteroid from which Bennu was broken off. Now, as we mentioned the other week, Bennu's rotational rate is accelerating, steadily increasing at a rate of about one second every hundred years. We think this is due to something called the Yorp effect, a phenomenon in which differences in reflectivity and temperature across an asteroid surface results in a faster spinning rate over time, which in some cases can ultimately lead to the asteroid breaking apart. 
In a surprise find, navigational images taken by the spacecraft upon arrival at Bennu show particles floating in the vicinity of the asteroid, possibly itsy-bitsy little moons, which will be investigated in more detail during the upcoming sample return site selection campaign. OSIRIS-REx is spending three years orbiting the asteroid at altitudes down as low as 5 kilometres, mapping Bennu's surface and geology, studying its evolution, composition, chemistry and mineralogy. Knowing Bennu's physical properties will be crucial for scientists trying to determine the likelihood of this mountain-sized asteroid slamming into the Earth. In July 2020, OSIRIS-REx will fly down and hover just above Bennu's surface, extending a robotic arm and collecting up to 2 kilograms of pristine asteroid regolith for sample return to Earth. The spacecraft slated to leave orbit in March 2021, with a sample return capsule being jettisoned for a parachute landing in the Utah deserts in September 2023. Professor Trevor Island from the Australian National University will analyse some of those samples once they return to Earth. He says the big question for him is whether the roughness and high number of boulders correspond with the age of the surface. Hopefully, with samples back in the lab, Ireland and colleagues will be able to determine the age of these surfaces by their solar wind and cosmic ray exposure rates. At Ruga, we already saw a large boulders. It was sort of a very similar sort of morphology of the of the planetary body, and we saw boulders there. So, in, in some ways, the, the boulders at Bennu aren't that really surprising, but it certainly brought home some of the aspects of sampling which hadn't been cons- well, had been considered, and I think it's just brought it home that you know, these, these bodies are one-off sort of things, and every one of them is sort of unique in a lot of its characteristics. So there's the surprises there. There's, there's certainly some uh, coarse grain material, but um, we've seen that before on both Itakawa and uh, Rugu, so they'll get on and do it. I'm sure there'll be no real problems in the end. I must admit, when I first saw those close-up views, well, relatively close-up views five kilometres away <laughs> of the new surface, I was shocked at just how rugged and how boulder-packed it really is. Yeah, so the, it looks like we're seeing more and more of these rubble pile asteroids but this mm. one's completely different from Itakawa it's the, the, the spinning top thing so one of the really intriguing things is going to be when we get the samples back is there going to be uh, are these samples going to be a lot older than they were on Itakawa or are they going to be something completely different that we, we haven't seen before and um, you know this is all of these things are happening in very short order in, in terms of 10 million years or something like that but um, I think that's going to be the intriguing thing my suspicion will be that Rugu and Bennu will be uh, quite a bit older than Itakawa, and that's reflecting the time to accrete into these sort of spinning top shapes. Now, you're going to be getting some of these samples to have a close look at. Tell me what your job will be. How do you go about investigating the, the samples you, you'll be getting? So we're trying to match these asteroids up with meteorites, and so we know what the meteorites roughly look like of these different types, and so we'll be looking to try and match what we think the, the asteroid is with the, the meteorite, but then we're certainly open to surprises and I'm sure we'll get some when, when we get the samples back. And what process do you go through then? Are you allowed to destroy the samples or are you only allowed to sort of look at them and, and draw what you can from them? No, some of these samples will be destroyed but there's a there's quite a, an established protocol for how you go through and maximise the benefit out of any grains that we, we get back. And uh, given the, the blast that we had on it looks like we've got a good sample on Rugu and uh, about December we'll be knowing how we got on with Bennu and see what comes back and, and what we can do with them. But uh, we certainly don't need very much material and you know, a few uh, half millimeter grains will basically establish a lot of the history of these asteroids. Well, that's all you could do with Itakawa, wasn't it? That's right. So we had those 1,500 grains of uh, the surface material and that certainly um, was very intriguing in terms of having that surface characterized. The interesting thing in comparison now is that we're going to take a sample which is from a larger subset. So if we get grams of material, then we've got lots of more of the inside of the of the asteroid that we'll be looking at. And then it'll be a question of can we actually get surface material that we can use to, to date the uh, the processes that are occurring on the surface of the asteroid. When we look at Bennu, it's got some looks like its surface is varied in age. It could that could well and This is going to be the fun thing because we're not necessarily going to get multiple samples um, of the asteroid. So there'll be uh, some decisions made as to, to where we go and what we get. 
Um, certainly in the, the bottom of the craters, people have argued, well, there should be younger stuff because of exposed fresher material down there. But a lot of the uh, the goals of NASA are to fi- follow the water, and so uh, maybe the water is concentrated in a slightly different regime. But the overriding consideration in terms of landing will be from the engineers to avoid anything which can sort of uh, destroy the mission and upset the spacecraft. So they'll be taking a fairly flat sort of region of the asteroid, and we'll just take what we get. Of the three asteroids, uh, Ryugu, Itakawa and, and now Bennu, do they all originate from different parts of space as far as we can determine different distances out from the sun? Well, we're not sure just yet because we don't know exactly what, you know, these are Ryugu and Bennu are both C-type asteroids and so we're not yeah, there, there's some arguments now that these may have formed on the other side of Jupiter. I'm not so sure about that. But certainly they come from the outer asteroid belt and probably came from that position in towards Earth. And there's, there's, there must have been something which has disrupted them at some stage. So if they're rubble piles, there's been a collision somewhere. What we'd like to know is, is that disruption occurred and reassembly occurred in the asteroid belt or did it occur after the impact on some sort of Earth-crossing orbit or has the asteroid actually evolved into that orbit? And so if we can get the dates of processes from the surface of the asteroid, then we go a reasonable way of trying to constrain what's actually going on on that surface. So this could help reinforce the Grand Tech theory? Could definitely do the Grand Tech. Um, I think that's that will be one of the intriguing things. Is, uh, it's it's yeah, some of these things are really difficult to date. So we we can date uh, probably the formation of the materials that have gone into Bennu. We can date the last sort of uh, exposure to solar wind. The question will be whether we can see some of those intermediate things which may have been related to the likes of Grand Tack disturbing or reassembling the asteroid belt at that stage and, and sending stuff into Earth-crossing asteroids. So one of the big questions will be, is it, is it was it disrupted at a very old age or is it being was it uh, disrupted at a younger age and then reassembled? So hopefully we can test some of those hypotheses out of these materials. 3.9 billion years being the key, I guess. Yeah, that's right. So do we see 3.9 or don't we? That's Professor Trevor Ireland from the Australian National University. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. A new study has ruled out primordial black holes as a possible explanation for that mysterious substance known as dark matter. Primordial black holes are tiny hypothetical singularities less than a millimetre wide, which were thought to have formed in the super-dense conditions of the very early universe over 13.5 billion years ago. Together with a whole menagerie of potential hypothetical subatomic particles, such as axions and sterile neutrinos, primordial black holes are among the most popular current ideas to try and explain dark matter. Scientists know dark matter is real because they can see its effects on normal matter. It stops galaxies flying apart and makes up at least 85% of all the matter in the universe. But it appears invisible and it only seems to act with normal matter gravitationally. So, finding out what dark matter is remains one of the biggest mysteries in science today. Scientists have used underground observatories, detailed studies of objects orbiting the halos of galaxies, and experiments at the world's largest particle accelerators to try and uncover the secrets of dark matter. Sadly, as yet, none of them have been successful. To try and resolve the issue, or at least tick off a few more boxes, An international team of researchers led by scientists from the Kavali Institute have decided to consider more closely Stephen Hawking's 1974 theory on the existence of primordial black holes, born shortly after the Big Bang, and his speculation that they could make up a large fraction of dark matter. The researchers used gravitational lensing to look for primordial black holes between Earth and the Andromeda Galaxy. First proposed by Albert Einstein, gravitational lensing occurs when light from a background object, such as a galaxy or a star, is bent and lensed by the mass of a foreground object passing in front of it. In extreme cases, such light bending causes the background object to appear much brighter than it actually is. However, gravitational lensing effects are rare, as they require the background and foreground objects to line up exactly with the observer. So, to maximise the chances of capturing such an event, researchers use the Hyper Supreme Cam digital camera on the Subaru telescope in Hawaii, which can capture all of the Andromeda galaxy in a single shot. Taking into account how fast primordial black holes, if they exist, are expected to move in interstellar space, the authors took multiple images in order to be able to catch the flicker of a star as it brightens for a period of just a few minutes to hours due to gravitational lensing. 
from 190 consecutive images of the Andromeda galaxy taken over seven hours during one clear night, the team scoured the data for potential gravitational lensing events. Now, if dark matter does consist of primordial black holes of a given mass, in this case, masses lighter than the Moon, the researchers expected to find about a thousand events. Reporting in the journal Nature Astronomy, the authors claim that after careful analysis, they could only identify one potential case, not a thousand. Now, if all this is correct, it means primordial black holes could contribute no more than about 0.1% of all the dark matter mass in the universe. Therefore, the authors speculate this hypothesis is unlikely to be correct. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. Newly processed close-up images of five of Saturn's moons show they're being coated with ice particles, dust and debris from the planet's ring system and from its ice moon Enceladus. The observations reported in the journal Science are based on data gathered back in 2017 during some of the closest flybys carried out by NASA's Cassini spacecraft. The study's lead scientist, Bonnie Baratti, from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, says the daring close flyby of these odd little moons has allowed scientists to peer into how they interact with Saturn's rings, showing how extremely active and dynamic the Saturnian ring and moon system really is. Scientists also found that the moon's surfaces are highly porous, further confirming that they were formed in multiple stages, as ring materials settled onto denser cores that may be the remnants of a larger object that had broken apart. The porosity also helps explain their shape. Rather than being spherical, they are all sort of blobby or ravioli-like, with material stuck around their equators. These tiny moons are scooping up particles of ice and dust from the rings in order to form little skirts around their equators. A denser body would have more mass and hence be self-gravitating, in other words, more ball-shaped. Of the satellites studied, the surfaces of those closest to Saturn, Daphnis and Pan, were the most altered by ring material. The surfaces of the moons Atlas, Prometheus and Pandora, further out from Saturn, have ring material as well, but they're also coated with bright icy particles and water vapour from the plumes spraying out of Enceladus. A broader outer ring of Saturn, known as the E-ring, is in fact formed by the icy material that fans out from the Enceladian plumes. A key puzzle piece was a data set from Cassini's visible and infrared mapping spectrometer. It was the first time that Cassini was close enough to create a spectral map of the surface of the innermost moon Pan. By analysing the spectra, astronomers were able to learn more about the composition of the materials on all five of the moons. The ring moons closest to Saturn appear the reddest, similar in colour to the main rings. Scientists believe the reddishness is caused by a mixture of organic compounds and iron. On the other hand, the moons just outside the main rings appear more bluish in colour, similar to the light from Enceladus's icy plumes. After a journey lasting some 13 years, the Cassini mission finally came to an end in September 2017, with the spacecraft low on fuel. Mission managers deliberately plunged Cassini into Saturn's atmosphere, rather than risk crashing the spacecraft into one of the planet's moons and contaminating that moon with Earth microbes. This is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Israel's Beersheet or Genesis spacecraft has successfully entered lunar orbit and is now expected to touch down on the surface of the moon on April the 11th. After travelling more than 5.5 million kilometres and orbiting the Earth some 12 times, Genesis successfully carried out its complex lunar orbit entry manoeuvre, undertaking a 72-second engine burn to slow down and allow the moon's gravity to capture the spacecraft and place it into lunar orbit. The manoeuvre put Genesis into an elliptical orbit around the moon, ranging from 500 to 10,000 kilometres above the lunar surface. Mission managers then began a series of engine burns designed to circularise the flight path into a 200 kilometre high circular orbit in preparation for descent and landing. Now safely circling the moon, Israel Aerospace Industries Space Division General Manager Ofer Doran says if all goes to plan, Israel will become only the fourth nation on Earth, after the Soviet Union, the United States and China, to land on the lunar surface. Glenn Nagel from NASA's Deep Space Communications Complex at Tidbin Bilani, Canberra, says the Deep Space Network has been assisting mission managers in Tel Aviv through every aspect of the mission. Bereshit or Genesis in the beginning, this is a mission that the Deep Space Network is supporting with two-way communications, uplinking any commands that the Space IL team require 
and of course getting that valuable data back, including, all being well, the successful landing of the spacecraft. Do we know yet exactly whether or not the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter will be in position to monitor the landing? Because that was one of the big hopes that we may be able to get the LRO to actually watch as the uh, Israeli spacecraft touches down. It all comes down to timing, of course. It's essential to be able to ensure that the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter can continue to do its regular job of observing. But if all goes well, depending on the timing of the landing, then it's possible that an image could be captured. This is not just a big mission for the Israelis. It's also a decent sort of mission for NASA as well. Uh, some laser retroreflectors will be placed on the lunar surface for a future moon navigation system. Yeah, so there's two very interesting experiments on board this spacecraft, the magnetometer to look at a bit more about the magnetic field of the moon, some things we still don't understand there, and this set of laser reflectors, which, as you say, will be used by future missions as a navigational target there in the Sea of Serenity to be able to guide future missions. And that's especially important now with the edict from Washington that we want American boots back on the moon within five years. There's a lot of excitement about our return to the moon, not only by NASA, but of course many nations and of course now private companies getting involved in this. And NASA has made no secret over the last few years of trying to build a coalition of countries and companies to be able to get human uh, feet back on the surface of the moon as soon as possible. And that includes the Gateway Project, the the next big space station being built by uh, NASA and uh, the European Space Agency and possibly also Russia as well. Yes, so the Lunar Gateway is an orbiting station around the moon, a point where we can go, dock, be able to use that as a staging point to send missions down to the surface and return back to lunar orbit. And even Australia has a good opportunity to play a role there, particularly in the area of robotics. The Canadians are going to supply a robot arm, but there's other types of robotics both outside and inside the spacecraft. Australia has a good niche in that we could actually fulfil. Yeah, Andy, Tom Thomas was talking about that even when the uh, International Space Station was still being put together. And he said it was a shame that Australia didn't at least have a, a scientific desk up there or something that was part of the research. The big advantage that we have now uh, as a country is that we now have an active space agency which is continuing to help open markets up to an ever-growing industry which will develop even more double, triple in size over the next decade. And I think we'll see uh, a bit more of Australian work there in orbit around the Earth and then journeying further to the moon and perhaps even tomorrow. That's Glenn Nagel from NASA's Deep Space Communications Complex in Canberra. The 585-kilogram Genesis spacecraft was blasted into orbit back on February the 22nd aboard a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket from Space Launch Complex 40 at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida. Once in orbit, Genesis flight path was designed to progressively increase its orbital apogee or furthest distance from the Earth until its orbit was so large it also encompassed the moon. This manoeuvre, known as orbital raising, has become the preferred method of reaching the moon for robotic missions. That's because it uses far less fuel than the more direct lunar transfer manoeuvre. But there is a downside, taking some seven weeks to complete, rather than just three days. The spacecraft will land on the Mare Serenitatis, or Sea of Serenity, a 674-kilometre-wide dark basaltic lava plain just east of the Mare Imbrium. Once on the lunar surface, Genesis will send back images and use its magnetometer to study the lunar magnetic field in order to help scientists better understand how the moon formed and cooled. As well as its scientific payload, Genesis is also carrying a digital time capsule known as the Arch Lunar Library, which contains over 30 million pages of data. There are millions of documents from around the world, including dictionaries and encyclopedias, a full copy of the English language Wikipedia, a copy of the Judeo-Christian Bible, examples of fine literature and art, as well as children's drawings, the memories of a Holocaust survivor, Israel's national anthem, the Hatikvah, an Israeli flag, and a copy of the Israeli Declaration of Independence. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. New Zealand's Electron rocket has carried out its first flight for the year, sending a United States Defense Department research satellite into orbit. The mission blasted off in spectacular fashion from Rocket Lab's Mahia Peninsula launch complex on New Zealand's North Island east coast. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2... Stage one propulsion is nominal. Getting a picture over. We have had successful liftoff of the R3D2 mission on Electron. Coming up soon, Electron will go through a series of mission milestones in quick succession, including main engine cutoff, or MECO, 
where the nine Rutherford engines on Electron's first stage will shut down. Shortly after this, we'll see stage one separation, followed by ignition of the vacuum-optimized Rutherford engine on Electron's second stage. Following second stage ignition, Electron's fairing will separate, revealing the payload in preparation for deployment approximately 50 minutes from now. Next cube. Stage one propulsion still nominal. AOS Chatham Station. Powerpack CO2 successful. Engines throttle down, 20 seconds remaining. Entering burnout detect mode. Stage one, Miko. Stage suppression succeeded. Mission on stage two, propulsion is nominal. Right down the center line. Fairing jettison. And there you have it. Confirmation that Electron's main engines have shut down as planned. We've had stage one separation, and the stage two engine has successfully ignited. Electron is now carrying on to orbit. Speed is three kilometers per second. Altitude is 150 kilometers. Stage two propulsion, still nominal. Getting throttle down. Guidance is nominal. One of the unique features about Electron is its Rutherford engine. These brushless DC motor engines are powered by lithium polymer batteries. In a few moments, we'll be performing a battery hot swap where we switch from two depleted batteries to a third fully charged battery. Shortly, we'll see the depleted batteries jettisoned to allow for a more efficient flight to orbit. Vehicles transited successfully to safe gate. HV battery hot swap. HV battery eject. HV propulsion still nominal. Entering stage two burnout detect mode. Successful transfer orbit. And stage separation. All right, you heard the call. The kick stage has now separated from Electron's second stage. Approximately 40 minutes from now, the Curie engine on the kick stage will ignite and circularize to a 425 kilometer orbit for payload deployment. The launch had been delayed by a month due initially to the late arrival of the satellite payload. But then there were problems with an onboard video transmitter. There were weather issues and problems with getting flight launch windows. The Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA, Radio Frequency Risk Reduction Deployment Demonstration Satellite was placed into a 425-kilometer high orbit. The 150-kilogram payload was at the top end of the two-stage Electron rocket's launch mass capability and required a third kick motor stage to place the satellite into its exact orbit. The satellite was designed to test new technologies for deployable antennas using a tissue-thin captain membrane foldable antenna designed to unfurl and expand out to some 2.25 metres in diameter. This would eventually allow the use of smaller satellites, but ones which would still be able to support high bandwidth communications. The flight marks the start of what's going to be a busy launch manifest for Rocket Labs and their Electron launch vehicle, with some 12 missions slated for this year. The company are planning to launch roughly every two weeks, both from New Zealand and eventually from their new launch complex now under construction at NASA's Wallops Island Flight Facility on the Virginia Mid-Atlantic Coast. The company says it's now building its Electron rockets at a rate of one per week and has developed a stockpile of 117 launch vehicles in various stages of completion. NASA says India's anti-satellite missile test last week has now created a cloud of over 400 pieces of orbital debris, which is slowly spreading around the planet some 300 kilometers above the ground. The American Space Agency's administrator, Jim Bridenstine, says that debris field was a terrible thing, which is placing the International Space Station and its crew at risk. The test involved a ground-launched missile slamming into an orbiting satellite believed to be the 740-kilogram Indian Space Research Organization's Microsat-R, which was launched back in January. The United States Air Force Space Command began tracking more than 270 new objects, larger than 10 centimeters in size, shortly after the impact in the area where the collision occurred. And as the cloud spread out, that's grown to more than 400 pieces. India's Ministry for Foreign Affairs claimed the test was conducted at the lower 300 km high altitude in order to ensure that atmospheric drag would cause rapid orbital decay, with most of the debris re-entering the atmosphere and burning up within a few weeks to months. But it seems debris and shrapnel from the blast was flung well above the impact zone, with at least 24 pieces large enough to be tracked, reaching an orbital altitude apogee above the 400 km high orbit of the International Space Station. Bridenstine's described the test as not being compatible with the future of human spaceflight. He says the test has increased the risk of debris hitting the space station by 44%. We know that we have identified 400 pieces of orbital debris from that one event. We know that 24 of them are going above the apogee of the International Space Station. That is a terrible, terrible thing to create an event that sends debris in an apogee that goes above the International Space Station. While the risk went up 44%, our astronauts are still safe. The International Space Station is still safe. 
If we need to maneuver it, we will. The probability of that, I think, is low. The United States Strategic Space Command is currently tracking more than 18,000 artificial objects in orbit above the Earth. Of these, only around 1,600 are operational satellites. The rest are disused spacecraft and spent rocket stages. But these are only objects large enough to be tracked from the ground. Current estimates suggest there are more than 950,000 bits of space junk a centimetre or larger in size and a staggering 170 million bits of debris a centimetre or smaller currently orbiting the Earth. One of the big fears are cascade events, where bits of space junk slam into satellites creating more debris, which then slams into other spacecraft creating even more debris and so on. About a third of all the debris currently in orbit was caused by Beijing back in 2007 when China conducted an anti-satellite missile test using a DF-21 ballistic missile to deliberately blow up and destroy an old Chinese weather satellite. The event remains the largest recorded creation of space debris in history, with well over 2,000 pieces of trackable-sized debris recorded in the immediate aftermath of the blast. The impact also created hundreds of thousands of bits of debris shrapnel, too small to be tracked, which have been slowly spreading out, forming a deadly cloud travelling around the Earth at 28,000 kilometres an hour. One of this debris cloud's first victims was a Russian laser-ranging satellite, which was struck and badly damaged back in 2013. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week, with a science report. A new study has found that one in five deaths globally, that's 11 million people, is associated with poor diet. The findings, reported in the Lancet Medical Journal, determined that cardiovascular disease was the biggest contributor, followed by cancers and type 2 diabetes. The largest shortfalls in global consumption were seen for foods such as nuts and seeds, milk and whole grains, while sugary drinks, processed meat and sodium were being overeaten. The largest number of diet-related deaths were associated with eating too much sodium, not enough whole grains and not enough fruits. Out of all 195 countries, the proportion of diet-related deaths was lowest in Israel and highest in Uzbekistan. The United Kingdom rated 23rd, the United States 43rd, China 140th and India 118th. New research has confirmed dramatic crashes in coral population numbers following mass bleaching events in the Great Barrier Reef in 2016 and 2017. The findings, reported in the journal Nature, show a 90% drop in the number of new corals settling on the reef compared to historical levels. The study also found that the mix of baby corals had shifted, which will also impact reef recovery. The researchers say it's still uncertain as to what extent the reef will be able to recover from this type of collapse especially given the projected increase in the frequency of extreme climatic events as a result of global warming. A new report warns that Iran is increasing its rate of cyber attacks on key targets of Britain's national infrastructure. Cybersecurity experts say Tehran's attacks have compromised targets ranging from Britain's parliamentary network to private sector companies such as banks. The report says the attacks, which included compromised data on numerous peers and members of parliament, were carried out by a covert agency within the Islamic Republic's Revolutionary Guard. Still in the Middle East, an archaeologist have uncovered a 2,600-year-old seal impression and stamp dating back to the time of the first temple in Jerusalem. The artifacts feature the Hebrew words belonging to Nathan Melech, servant of the king. The name Nathan Melech appears in the second book of Kings, 2311, where he was described as an official in the court of the Judean king, Josiah. He is said to have been involved in the religious reforms which the king was implementing in order to return the children of Israel to traditional Jewish teachings. The title Servant of the King appears in biblical text and on stamp and seal impressions to inscribe a high-ranking official close to the king. Well, it seems GPS systems have just survived their own version of the Y2K bug. The problem involved the timestamping signals GPS systems use to determine location. These count weeks and seconds in the week. All the systems use a 10-digit field topping out at 1,024 weeks, making April the 6th, 2019 the GPS version of Y2K. Once this 10-digit field fills up, devices would reset to zero, potentially causing problems with older GPS units. The same problem also happened on August the 21st, 1999, when GPS counters reset. But back then there was little disruption, as satellite navigation wasn't anywhere nearly as widely used as what it is today. 
The good news is that most devices manufactured after 2010 are designed with a 13-digit counter, so it only needs to roll over once every 157 years. The Y2K Millennium Bug related to the formatting and storage of calendar data for dates beginning in the year 2000. The problem centred around older programs that used a numerical chronology system in which years were only represented by the last two digits, making the year 2000 indistinguishable from the year 1900. There were fears the issue could cause various errors, stemming from the incorrect display of dates and consequential inaccurate ordering of automated dated records or real-time events. Programmers were involved in a global effort to prepare for and ultimately successfully resolve the issue. Cat owners have always known that their pets recognise key words, such as their name or the call to dinner or when it's bath time. But up until now, there's always been that question of whether that's real or whether it's just some anthropomorphic trait that owners give their furry babies. But now, scientists have confirmed that kitty cats don't just respond to the sound of a can of food being opened, they also really do recognise their own individual names. Researchers in Japan tested 78 cats from households and from a cat cafe by saying four different words followed by the cat's name. The responses, ranging from moving their ears, heads, tails or vocalising, indicated the felines distinguished their own names from general nouns even when these words had similar sounds to their names, or when an unfamiliar person was speaking them. You can read the findings in detail in the journal Scientific Reports. You're listening to Space Time, I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and available around the world on TuneIn Radio. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lower case, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 